Liberty fabrics have been in production in the UK since 1875. Since then, generations of sewers have fashioned prints like Hera, Ianthe, Strawberry Thief, and Michelle into dresses, curtains, quilts, and more. My next guest, Jenny Smith, is the author of Quilting with Liberty, 15 quilts celebrating 145 years. That's right. 15 quilt patterns, and she was able to get up close and personal with the fabrics, the store, and the story behind the brand. And she's going to tell us all about it. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here is my interview with Jenny Smith. Thank you, Jenny, for being on the show today. You're coming to us from the UK. Where in the UK are you? I live in the north of England in the county of Yorkshire in a town called Ilkley. Now, I understand you have a Toronto connection with your quilting career. I do. Uh, it's where it all began for me in Toronto. So, I mean, growing up, I, I was always creative and I did dressmaking and my grandfather used to build boats and caravans and my mum and my nan made the upholstery. So it was like I knew how to sew, but definitely had never done quilting. And then I came out for a year in, well, my, my son was one and now he's nearly 17. So quite a while ago now. And my husband did a medical fellowship in Toronto and I just decided not to work for that year and, you know, just have time with my son and enjoy the city. And I found a YMCA where Harry could go for a little bit of childcare because I was obviously away from my family network and things. And so the first morning I dropped him off at the YMCA. I'd never left him anywhere, I don't think. Um, so I burst <laughs> into tears and kind of stood in the street not knowing what to do with myself. And next to the YMCA, as I turned to the right, there was a shop called the Quilter's Garden out in the beaches. So I kind of went in there with tears streaming down my face and, um, and remember seeing all these fabrics laid out before me and and I got talking to the the shop owner and some ladies in there and they were like well if you're English and you don't know how to quilt I think they assumed maybe everybody did know how to quilt you know English paper piecing and things but they kind of took me under their wing and I went there for classes whenever Harry was in childcare and, and sometimes on an evening I made a giant snowball quilt all by hand because I didn't have access to a sewing machine. Made two more quilts, I think, and then came back home to England and have never stopped quilting since. <laughs> wow. So were textiles part of your art history degree that you could bring to your quilting? No, actually. So I, I did a, a year, an art foundation year here in the UK between school and university where you try a lot of different mediums and did a little bit of printing on textiles. Um, and but it was that was a lot of fine art and things. And then at university, I actually studied history of art and Italian. So they were the academic subjects, really. And I, I wasn't particularly creative at that point. But I think probably you know, with, with art history, the reason people make paintings or sculptures is always very much a, so, you know, it's, it's his, social history as well, why people make what they make and why that matters. And I think that definitely translates into, into quilting as well. So I've always been interested in the storytelling aspects, I guess, of craft as well. So with those first quilts that you made, did you have a stash to start with or you were starting from scratch? I mean, I did have a bit of a stash back in England because I think I'd just, again, always been drawn to textiles and somehow there were things like childhood duvets and things from my childhood bedroom materials and like a dress that my nan bought me when I was young that I'd never thrown away so that I've come back to later and that are now part of my stash. But actually in Toronto, it was just like, I'm going to buy all the fabrics this is my new hobby I'm just gonna get you know and and it's still I think in the US and Canada we still really here in England we don't have many fabric shops where you would ever have that that's you know that scale of choice really so it was it was amazing I kind of do miss that a little bit sometimes well even from Canada to the US the scale of the stores in the US is just so huge it's truly like be going to FAO Schwartz, you know, in a toy store, going to the States and going into some of their big, big stores. Very rarely here would you get a kind of a comprehensive entire 
quilt collection and have all the prints before you to see you know so we apart from at big shows like festival of quilts where you have vendors there otherwise you'd have to travel quite a way or you have to kind of trust your instinct and buy online apart from liberties so I guess that's partly why I love liberties as well (laughs) so did you have any idea when you reached out to liberty the scope of the work that you were about to embark on I think I had an inkling because I'd had some friends who'd written books like Karen Lewis, the textile designer is a good friend of mine. So I knew that it would be quite a lot of work. And I think it was just because Liberty in itself is such a big company. So so managing the whole book project, you know, it was just a case of managing a lot of different relationships because there's Liberty, the store, there's Liberty, the design studio, there's Liberty, the haberdashery and, you know, trying to kind of, I wanted it to be a big team project um, and everyone to feel like they had a, a part in that. And it was, you know, so I did have a lot of support as well, but just keeping everybody on the same page and up to date, you know, I've never counted the number of emails back and forth, but there must have been hundreds and hundreds throughout, you know, it was kind of a two year process really to write the book. Were all the projects in the book made from your stash or were you able to access some behind the scenes yardage and scraps? We were really lucky, like we designed all of the quilts ourselves. So they're all, you know, we is me and Kay Walsh, who I work with, like my studio manager. And so we were able to design all the quilts and the design studio at Liberty actually gave us some of the digital files for the fabric so that we could trial out fabrics and see really what the quilts would look like once we'd stitched them. And that was a brilliant part of the process. And that's where the Liberty Studio really got quite involved, recommending fabrics and and everything. And then once we'd picked them, then they sent us all the fabrics for all the quilts. So there's a couple in there that um, the eclectic quilt is a bit of a nostalgic one, and that's my personal stash, but everything else, Liberty, gave to us so that was nice and even on the they were like oh what do you want to put on the back of the quilt so we I was feeling very extravagant I was like well I'll have five yards of beautiful tan along please if uh, (laughs) you're sending them so they used to come from the mill in Italy with these little stickers on and the little stamps straight from the mill so I've got an even better stash now because I've got all the leftovers as well the coming with the stamps on it like that's worthy of saving you know it's just funny those little details when you're looking at in your book, in the section on how they actually made the prints, you know, those books and the archive, that must have been just fabulous to be part of, just to be in the same room as. Did you feel that that wonder too? Yeah, definitely. Quite a few years ago in the UK, there was a lovely exhibition about Liberty and a bit of the history of the company at the Fashion and Textile Museum in London. And I went down with a big group of my friends and I remember, I don't know if it was an Instagram post or like a challenge once you had to write down something on your bucket list. And mine was like, imagine if I could go to the Liberty Archive one day and then it came true. So right at the beginning of of the book project, I went down and Anna Baruma, who's the head archivist at Liberty, she's been there about 25 years. She did a like a presentation for me in the art. So there's a small archive room actually on site in London. And then the, uh, the real archive, is in a big aircraft hangar and nobody, even the design studio, many of them have never been there because a lot of it's digitized or they'll send objects out from there, but I've never been there yet. But the archive room itself, you know, they've still got some of those beautiful sample books and wood blocks that they would have printed from and that kind of thing. So you get, you get a sense of the history for sure. When I looked up the book on Amazon, it said 14 quilts in 140 years, but the book is 15 (laughs) quilts. And 145 years. Did did you add a did you add a quilt as you went along? Yeah, I did. And I don't I think that I think that was a bit of a typo early on that some some document must go somewhere to to Amazon because the years thing was never gonna have gonna be accurate because it was 1875 when the company was founded. But I did add on a quilt right at the end because we were working with a seasonal collection that came out on Tarn Along called From London with Love, and it just had the another beautiful fabric in that we knew we could make an English paper piecing project from so I went back to my editor and was like can we just do one more project and and she said yes and and it kind of fit because yeah there was there's one quilt project for every decade of Liberty's history kind of really is is how it was researched and and how I set it out um so we could go into that 15th quilt without too much trouble So 15 quilt patterns, that is a crazy amount of work. 
how did the designs come to you? Did you have all 15 to begin with? Well, you've just explained you've only had 14, but <laughs> did you have them and then present them or were they sort of organic as you went along? I daydream quite a lot. Like I do live a lot of the time in my head thinking about things. So for quite a few months when I was, the idea of this book was forming, I was starting to look at books I had on my on my shelf, you know, about the history of liberty and history of design and the Victorian Albert Museum from that period and, and just start to think, okay, well, in the early days, again, in art history terms, it's kind of the aesthetic period, like post-industrial revolution you know beautiful and then I knew about Art Nouveau so there were and kind of mid-century design so there were already just markers I think that I could kind of start to think of and then I did some more in-depth research and then I would just scribble a terrible looking design really we designed a couple of quilt projects before but never really you know that wasn't our, our job we were quilting teacher so I knew the pain points of how people learn and what to avoid or you know what kind of challenges I wanted to set people with their making so I wanted people to learn have a gut foundation piecing and curve piecing so there were there were kind of so many elements to put into the designs and then we would play around and then we'd go back and forth with the design studio at Liberty and play with fabrics. And at, at the same time, my editor, Suzanne Woods at Lucky School would be steering us a little bit, you know. I mean, the peacock feather, the Arthur quilt at the beginning of the book is really quite complex. And, and we figured out how to design it. And then we were like, oh, but now we've got to make it, you know. So then at one point we were gonna scale it back just to half square triangles. And Suzanne was like, you can't do that. That's, a, you know, that will be the quilt that will, pop up on Pinterest or you know visually it's really even it, but I was like yeah but it's hard for people to make but I suppose there's always that balance in a quilt book somebody said to me early on I suppose like with a cookbook you know with there might be two or three recipes out of 15 20 that would if they if you think I, I'd have a go at that that's enough for you to want to buy the book you know you never I don't think you can ever create 15 quilt patterns that will suit everybody's taste or you know processes they enjoy doing but if you try and capture people with a couple then then hopefully that's enough and I think that was quite once I'd thought about that I felt like I had a little bit more artistic freedom and liberty in itself the store the company the fabrics are very eclectic and a little bit eccentric so I felt like that also gave me the freedom you know to be a little bit eclectic with the styles of quilts in there really you know because I'm, I don't think people would know or Jenny Smith she's you know she just does foundation paper pieced flowers or something like that I didn't have a style because I'm quite new in this industry so it was nice really to have a big melting pot of quilts and I think you actually did a, a very good job you've got some beginner quilts in there you've got some scrappy quilts you've got ones for people who like to hand sew and ones for people that like to paper piece and you certainly, the peacock one is the showstopper, but mind you, I like the style one too. Yes. You gave a couple of different color directions on that. And I really like that one. So I think you did a great job. You know, because that's always the challenge with, with the fabrics in a book is that fabrics come and go, you know, and some Liberty fabrics are seasonal, but where we could, we tried to also work with a lot of the classic tan alarms so that people can you know, sometimes people really want to replicate the exact fabrics, don't they? But you can't always do that. So at the moment with the design studio, we're still re like we just recolored the style quilt in a, a new quilting cotton fabric that's come out, like produce the graphic of that so that we can try and always keep it current and exciting as well, you know, because it's tricky, isn't it? If once the fabrics have gone, sometimes they've gone. <laughs> Personally, I have never been in the Liberty fan group because it's just not my energy. But after I listened to your lecture and read your book, I'm thinking about Liberty fabric quite differently. First of all, I want a bolt of Tresco. I, I, I never realized that that, <laughs> that like that. And it's just so gorgeous. I would love a bolt of it. But I've always looked at when I look at Liberty fabrics, I look at them in terms of yardage and what it would look like in a top or a dress. And as I said, that's just not my energy. But with your projects, I saw that when you just take it down, it's the scale of the prints and the symmetries like Loden, which I like to use in my piecing. So I realized that 
I've got to look at it differently. I've got to look at the, look at it from a piecing point of view, not from a garment point of view, which I think Liberty fabrics are just absolutely gorgeous for. Did you make any new discoveries on how to use them? Yeah, because I think I've always, what's always mar like I felt quite marvelous about them, I think is how they're so, you can have such different in scale and stories and colorways and details going on in the prints. And yet there's somehow this, they kind of work together and may, maybe that, that eclectic eccentric style and vibe that the design studio has always had helps with that a little bit. Um, but I think also mixing them up a little bit with some of like the quilting cottons coming on board, you know, in the last few years has been nice because then you've got some blenders in there that have still got that iconic Liberty silhouette on them. So you, you know, they're not just your average blender, but they give you that opportunity to let some of the other Liberty prints sing. And I think that was really helpful to, to bring those into the mix as, as well. And I just never get bored of working with them because I think the level of detail is there's always something that you see slightly different, I think. I mean, Sally Kelly, who designed Tresco, was at Liberty for 20 years, and now she's a designer in her own right for Wyndham. And I just never get bored, even when she sends me a new print, you know, that, that level of detail, I think, is amazing. And I think they can look, you know, we did like the, the Blake quilt is really contemporary, really modern and and yet some of them can be really look really traditional but you can somehow mash them all up I think and I think I feel like I still got a lot to learn playing with them but they do just seem to have this this charm that people are drawn to and I think often as well because some of those prints they're based like Loddon and you know and the peacock feather because they're like William Morris prints they just register, there's that familiarity in people's minds from interiors and curtains and maybe like a stores decor from years ago. There's, you know, there's that familiarity, which instantly means you have a connection, I think, with, with that print, you know, and the strawberry thief. There's a distant memory somewhere of, isn't it? You know, that's what it is for me. It's kind of my friend's homes growing up or the wallpaper or something that it just kind of always draws me to them. I remember finding out that, that was the name of the print, the Strawberry Thief. And it was just, it was a lovely being able to put a name on it. Oh, there's history attached to this. And you see it all the time now and various other designers have done their play on it. It's just beautiful. So you've started working with quilt folks sort of as their UK correspondent. <laughs> Tell us about the online show that you host. Well, so for Quilt Folk, I mean, I subscribe to Quilt Folk magazine. It's improved my US geography no end for one thing, which was pretty terrible. And again, it's the stories in there, isn't it? And visually, it's so beautiful. And they had my Liberty book as a book of the month. So originally, I started talking to them about that. And then we got chatting about lots of other ideas and, and shared values, really, um, about telling stories. And we tried, we recorded a little trial podcast at one point but then I was I was a bit frustrated that it wasn't visual and then one day in lot I just said to Mike McCormack like why don't I try a little virtual show and tell because people are missing that vibe I was missing that at the time like not having my studio where I teach and seeing what people are making and you know spurring each other on to the finish and that kind of thing so I was like what if I, I interviewed people about what they're working on at the moment because also the magazine is always being produced several months ahead of the time so they can't always be as responsive to to what people are making here and now and because it's US based the magazine at this point I was like we need to get outside the US and you know because they have a lot of a readership outside of the US, but grow this and nurture this community. So I interview people all over the world from my, just like we're doing now, you know, on Zoom from my little studio and, and then edit them. And, and it's really interesting. It's, it's lovely, lovely work. I've met some amazing quilters learning about new techniques, new styles and everything. So I really missed, I suppose, having done the book and that being such a big part of my life and doing the research and, and meeting new people through that I think I was missing that that connection so producing the show and tell fills a lovely gap and it's very exciting and how often does it run so we put out one about once a month basically so we've just done seven episodes I think so far I started in in March doing those next I'm trying to investigate kind of 
if there's hol traditions around the holidays and Christmas, what people, you know, things that people have made that have a special significance that maybe come out year after year and, and how that's celebrated in different places. So that's what I'm on with at the moment for the next one. We've been doing the virtual workshops as well for Quilt Folk. So it's it's been a busy old month. Well, speaking of workshops, you did the Bronte workshop with Mary Fonz. I attended it just because I love the history part of it as well as the quilt. But how long did it take to put that together? Mary came up to Yorkshire to show around. Like Mike kept saying, you know, Mary's over in the UK. You two need to hook up. I think you'd get on really well. And I've listened to Mary's lectures. Like I love Mary Fonz. So she, it was, it, yeah, I just needed to find a way to work together. So she came up and I'd had this idea of, well, I knew Mary loved literature. So it's like, okay, why don't I show her the Brontes and there's this quilt, you know, we need to investigate. So we sent her home. The first trip she came up, I sent her home on the train with Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre to read. And then she kept messaging and she's like, Jenny, I love it. I love it. So Did you not read them before? No, never. She honestly didn't know much about the Brontes at all so then she was all totally transfixed and in that world and then we were like okay well let's let's try this out so we did another day filming at the parsonage and back here and then Kay and I there was a bit of back and forth getting permission as to what we could actually replicate you know from the original quilt because it's like there's a charity in the Bronte parsonage and things but once we'd had the sign off, it took us a few days to come up with a project and make a sample. You know, again, wanting nice teachable moments, how we could break it up so people would learn different things, bit of hand sewing, bit of machine sewing. Because I think in these virtual workshops, it's lovely if you can sit and stitch and listen and watch, you know, as well as being on your machine. And then we did it, didn't we? We found some recipes, confused everyone with our Yorkshire accents, I think, about what Yorkshire parking was to eat and things like that we really enjoyed doing it and I think met like Mary went off and did the research on the quilt side like I think in that sense it was quite a nice duo because I I love the teaching as well and again I've missed that in lockdown so it was it was lovely just to be able to have a mixture of all those elements we're kind of breaking new ground and making it up you know as to what we think we would like in an experience but I think people enjoyed it and you know one person on Instagram said oh in a way it's like an introvert stream because not everybody would want to come to a workshop or necessarily can travel particularly in these times but I guess if you know you're hanging out with like-minded people that's a lovely you know it's nice isn't it for people I think. So have you passed on your love of quilting to your children? Well my eldest son got his worst mark ever in textiles at school. <laughs> He brought back this doorstop that was stuffed with rice that was already like trailing all over the floor as it came home. My daughter is 14 almost. She she can sew. What's nice is that they, they have always made like gifts for the teacher with me at the end of term. You know, they've come and we've done like a one hour basket or a scarf or I did the a quilt, the Love and Kisses block from my book this time with my youngest son. So I think they know the value of giving something handmade. They can see that the person appreciates that they've put in the time rather than saying, oh, mum, can we just go and buy flowers or something? But ED, my daughter would choose to bake, I think, rather than stitch. And then my youngest, Ellis, he's nine, and, and he does craft a little bit. He comes and hangs out in here with me. I've just done the big Violet Craft Cheetah quilt for him, and he kind of enjoyed helping pull out the papers and and do some little bits on the machine. So hopefully a little bit. They're always snuggled beneath my quilts, whether they're just watching TV or what have you, you know, the quilts are always that within arm's length. So, so that makes me happy. If your house was burning down, is there one quilt that you would save before all the others? The quilt that I sleep beneath myself each night does have Liberty Fabrics in it. And it is really why I think part of the idea for the, for the book sparked because it's got a fabric in there by an artist for Liberty called Edwin Collins and I bought a print by him. He, he, he was a musician who had a double brain hemorrhage and as part of his rehabilitation he started to draw birds each day like to develop and strengthen you know his brain and the connections and everything and I helped with an exhibition of his drawings 
And then Liberty I actually printed some of his drawings onto fabric. And one of the drawings that I own of a puffin um, was on that fabric. So then I was like, okay, I've got to make a quilt, you know, with this beautiful fabric and some other Liberty prints. And then what was left of my wedding dress, which got quite trashed on my wedding day, it had a top layer of organza that got all ruined um, through wild dancing and things. I eventually, I also cut that up. And that's in the quilt. So there is the quilt. I think when I made that quilt, I realised you can kind of tell stories um, and put meaning into quilts, which eventually led me to the ideas for the book. So probably if my house was burning down, that's the one quilt that I would want to save because, you know, I've nursed all my children underneath it and it's witnessed lots of good times and bad times probably. So it has, a, you know, a big place in my heart. Do you put a label on your quilt? Well, I haven't done the last one yet, but yes, I do. I am I am quite good at that. I mean, my daughter, one of her earliest quilts, I wrote a really nice message. And then I like, and I'd picked all the fabrics in the quilt, or some of them were her old clothes. And then I said, Do you want a little something on the label? And she chose this like really ghastly sequined butterfly, I think it was. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I stitched that on the label. I was like, oh, I don't really like that. <laughs> so next time, maybe I, I don't think I've asked her since. I just do my own. So you just write it on a scrap piece of fabric? Yeah. One of Ellis's last quilt, there was a T-shirt that had an emblem, a motif on, that I've got pictures of my husband where he wore it for like too many years, basically. But I've got pictures of him with like snuggling all our kids at various ages with this t-shirt on and eventually like it got holes in it and you know it was was going to throw it away and I said no I'll keep it for a quilt label so that's on the back of my son's um not the cheetah quilt but the one before that and then I just embroidered a message on it so sometimes you know it's a bit of shirt you know something that still has a little bit of significance that I would try and use that's nice. Imagine if the Bronte sisters had put a label on their quilt and we knew a bit more about it. And actually, I haven't labelled the quilts from the book yet because we finished them, we put hanging sleeves on, they went off to be photographed. And, you know, but again, probably because I don't even know what to do with the quilts from the book. I've been trying to think of nice ways to eventually have those seen and enjoyed by people, you know, because it's just sad then to make them all, put all that work in and then, then just sit unused in a way I don't know what other people do if they keep them all forever more I know I've kept my original ones of the patterns that I have made thinking there's an archive there but then it becomes a storage solutions right you should send it to Houston as an exhibit I think now that the world's opening up a little bit more you know there might there might be opportunities have you done a lot of traveling for quilting I came to spring market in St. Louis so that's actually how the quilting book got started. I'd been trying to work with Liberty for many years in the UK, been to their open call, queued up at four o'clock in the morning to meet the buyers, like all these things. And then I came out to Quilt Market with my dressmaking patterns and got a bit of money to like export funding to come out to learn more about business in the US. And on the last afternoon, I was working out there with Aurifil as well, doing some demos. And Brad at Aurifil said, Jenny, she's from Liberty. Um, and they were over just with their new quilting cottons. So that's when I actually made the connection with someone within the quilting team, which led to me doing some free patterns for quilts and then led to the, you know, got me an in really to get the book made. So it was funny, I had to come all the way to America to actually, you know, hook up with a British company. <laughs> and Kay and I came out to QuiltCon in Nashville. So again, that was quite early on when the book was being made. So we came out for meetings um, with Lucky Spool and everything and combined it with with visiting Nashville. I've traveled around the UK like teaching and been up into Scotland, but hopefully more travel on the horizon. Liberty have got an office in Tokyo. So they have offices in London, in New York and in, in Tokyo and Japan. I would love to go to Japan one day. That's definitely on the wish list. And then with the Quilt Folk workshops, we're hoping, and you know, maybe some more digital editions of the magazine, you know, we want to start traveling. Mike keeps saying, come on, Jenny. Where are you going next? So, so hopefully we can start to travel soon. Do you consider yourself a modern or traditional quilter? You know, no one's ever asked me that question before. Really? Yeah, I'm too eclectic. I think this is the thing. I love traditional patterns because I love the history and the stories in there. 
but I also really like making things up and and not having any restrictions do you know Jenny Smith the quilter I still don't know that I have found my true artistic kind of voice I really admire people I'm always on the booth at Festival of Quilts in the UK with Sheena Nerd Choir a Scottish textile artist who has such a clear aesthetic or you know when I look at Nancy Cross somebody you know their work you'd walk into a gallery you would know that's their work Um, and I always feel like I'm a bit too much of a magpie that I get excited by always trying new things as yet you know and I still don't know that I've got that real clear aesthetic which is maybe why I don't know if I'm truly traditional or modern yet and I think Maybe that's, I keep thinking, when will I have time just to play a little bit more to discover that voice? Because I think with the Liberty book, there was kind of a brief in my head to be met. And I felt like it was a really creative process. But as I say, the quilts are so varied in style. It's quite hard to pinpoint one, isn't it? I mean, what would I'll ask you, what do you think I am? Looking at these designs, I was really impressed how it opened up possibilities in my head. You know, like even like Bishopsgate. I'm not really a Dresden plate type of person, but looking at that one, I would go, oh, oh, I, I, that's a different way of using it. And I really enjoyed the way that, for whatever reason, it gave me pause to look at it. Now, I'm not necessarily a modern quilter. I think there's a real muddy middle between those who are absolutely modern and absolutely traditional. And I think I fall in there. But even though the fabrics within it, I would consider traditional. I think that's a real modern way that you've done it. And yeah, like I, I was really quite impressed with your use of fabrics and how you opened up new possibilities from what you might think a traditional way of doing that one would be. Even with your, even the other way, the the modern ones, how you made them more traditional by using the Liberty fabric. So I think you're really right down the middle. (laughs) Okay, that sounds good. My editor said right at the beginning, you know, she, she said, well, the thing will be if we do this book, she said, your job will be to, you know, to make the Liberty fabrics sing. So that's what I always had in the back of my mind. So sometimes you need paws or a bit of grey Essex linen to make the traditional floral sing and perhaps look a bit modern. So, so it wasn't always just this rainbow of, of Liberty florals, which I think is what people imagine perhaps, or that in some of the other books about sewing with Liberty, I think the, quilt, the quilts all looked a little bit more classic and what you would expect. So, you know, Arthur Liberty, who founded the company, was always trying to push boundaries and, and be creative. And I think I was just always try, trying to challenge maybe what people would imagine it might be. So maybe I'm a, just a quilt, a, a bit of a rebel quilter. <laughs> this is my personal opinion, is that you're on this journey to become a quilter. And at some point, you may settle into a niche. You find that's your, your expertise and or that just feeds the part of your brain that wants to be fed but there's still value in dabbling in everything that is your aesthetic each one will be different you you can't count on somebody to be a particular way so I think that's the wonderful thing about quilting is there's no even though there's there's supposedly quilt police police out there there's no rules there's no rules it can it can feed so many different souls and you just let it let it do what it needs for you at that time yeah and that's why you never get bored because you know there's a technical challenge if you want it isn't there there's always new people to discover new techniques but I just think there's always a, a story I think there always has to be a story the motivation that would get me through a quilt project is trying to tell that story I think and maybe that means I'm more of an emotive maker then, then I don't always think through the practicalities of a project. It's just, okay, I want to do that with those fabrics because that means that and let's do it and get on with it, you know, and then move on to the next thing. Well, as we all say, quilting is a marathon. So that story is part of the engine that gets you to the finish line. Do you have another book in the works? Well, no, I am writing, but it's more like not a practical quilt book, but again, like kind of based more on the storytelling and the work I'm doing with Quilt Folk. I, I'm writing, 
for a different purpose and it, whether it will become a book in the end I'm not too sure but it won't have patterns or quilts to make so <laughs> it will hopefully might not take as long but we'll see so tell me about your lectures and workshops that you offer how do people find you I do a lecture about the writing of the book you know the stories of the quilts all the histories and everything and you can book that on my website so I'm Jenny with an I hyphen smith.co.uk workshops I'm just people are starting to request workshops I think initially I was just so busy with the lectures and and everything that I wasn't offering workshops but some people are asking now because I've been doing some of the quilt foot ones as well so I think soon there will be more information on that on my website or people can email me if they've got a particular request or a particular project from the book and I'd be happy to teach that. And I do do some crazy hours, like middle of the night lectures and things, because I think, you know, it's fair enough. It's I can get up and come into my little studio and, and go back to bed afterwards. So I don't mind that because I, I think, you know, I'm just really pleased to be sharing the stories and, and the book at this time. So that's OK. And how do they find you on social media? On social media, pretty much everywhere. I'm Jenny Smith. Sows. So on Instagram and my Facebook is Jenny Smith Sows. Pinterest, I've got some boards with lots of Liberty prints and things on there if you want to find out the names of things as well. And on YouTube. And then if not, my Quilt Folky tales and stories are on Quilt Folk's YouTube and also on their website as well. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today with me. I really appreciate the time and really enjoyed our talk. Me too. Thank you for having me. Hopefully I can come to Toronto and we can have a cup of tea in real life one day. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Jenny Smith. I loved how her passion for liberty inspired a whole book. Personally, it led me out of my comfort zone and look at their fabrics in a whole new way. If you'd like to connect with Jenny about her lecture, her book, or her cool folk series, I'll leave all your contact information in the notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Christina de Miranda of Ships and Violins. Her bold geometric patterns are fresh and dynamic and she has a wonderful quilt story, and you don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, make sure you have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing quilters. Let one inspire you. And don't forget to check out my last video, Five Ways to Use Up Your Fabric Scraps with Raw Edge Applique. Take care, and I'll see you next time.